In preparation for our event on whether or not we should defund the police, I had the opportunity to sit down with Frank Zimring, an American criminologist and professor of law at the UC Berkeley School of Law. Zimring specializes in criminal justice and emphasizes the use of empirical research to inform legal policy. Zimring's most recent book, When Police Kill, investigates how, when, where, and why police use deadly force. I found this conversation very informative, and Frank makes several assertions that are contrary to many claims and demands of the Black Lives Matter movement. Frank asserts that both defund the police and abolish the police are merely metaphors, that there is no alternative to policing in urban populations, and that calls to actually abolish the police are thoughtless. Rather than abolishing the police, Frank says that our main focus should be on updating policies to make it much less permissible for police officers to use excessive force. Frank says that racism in the police force has very minor influence on deaths resulting from police shootings, and points out that 53% of police shooting victims in America are white, non-Hispanic males. Enjoy. This is Frank Zimmering. Hello, hello. Okay, this is Frank Zimmering. Share screen, record, chat. Hello. Well, uh, hello. Yeah. Hey. I'm beginning to worry. It, it looks very much like daylight where you are. I really appreciate you, you staying up a little late to, to be able to chat with us and extend your workday some. What on earth do people mean when they say defund the police? It's a metaphor. Uh, but then if it's a metaphor, what does it stand for or represent? And the answer is that varies depending upon the speaker. In the middle of the kind of emotive conversations that we're having now, you never really get to questions of definition and precision. If you ask the question, what for cities of any size in the developed world is the alternative uh, to local policing, uh, uh, the answer is not much. Uh, every major city has a police force. Policing in some form uh, is probably part of urban destiny everywhere. That doesn't mean that you can't have controls and improvements, but it does mean that you can't very well disestablish the institution or, or replace it with something that would be less objectionable. Now, there are places where uh, police functions are taken over by military forces. And that is almost inevitably god-awful worse than anything that you would get from local governmental policing. What you really want is better policing, and you also want a very specific attention to particular problems. Uh, what you're worried about is life-threatening violence, uh, which is an enormous problem in the United States. We kill three people a day, every day. And 90% of those are gunfire. That is remarkably different from almost any other developed country. The only place close to us, really, uh, would be Canada, which is a third of our rate. Um, and that turns out to be something uh, that very simple administrative rules can control very effectively and at minimal cost. There are less uh, uh, problematic and life-threatening forms of violence uh, that may be a little bit harder to control. What you have to do to reduce the number of killings by police is to reduce with substantial and specific rules the number of situations in which police are permitted to shoot. And you do that with what my book calls don't shoot rules. You essentially restrict the use of deadly force by police to situations where police lives or those of other innocent persons 
are in intense danger. And those are only situations involving the very proximate risk of gunfire from assailants. But almost half of all the situations that produce police killings involve assaults that don't kill police and that are not life-threatening. All police administrators will have to do is tighten the rules very specifically, publish them, and make them stick with administrative and financial remedies. Uh, It turns out that for most shootings, those that are arguably within a permissible police behavior under current circumstances, the criminal law is useless because the criminal law is only when you can point the finger of blame at the individual police officer. The Minnesota case, yes, is a wonderful example of a practice that was already forbidden in Minneapolis, and therefore the rules that we need were in place. They were violated. And under those circumstances, The individual police officer that crosses the established norm can be blamed, and the criminal law makes sense. But that's a small minority of the police killing cases. Most of the cases are arguably within the standards of what police rules now allow. That's the problem. And the solution to that is to change the police rules. I feel like a real failure, not because anybody argued with the data or or anybody argued uh, with the particular conclusions that I drew from the data, but it is that police chiefs don't seem to care. That is an essential failure of American government. Have there been any places where similar policies like your do not shoot rules have been instated? And I imagine that the primary argument made against the implementation of do not shoot rules is that any hesitation from a police officer may result in the in the loss of life of a police officer or of an innocent bystander. And that these do not shoot rules, any calculation that a police officer must do would cause hesitation in the police officer to respond. It's much easier than that. Let's talk about what the do not shoot rules are. In 44% of the cases in which police officers shot and killed civilians, the civilian assault was characterized by the police officer as the police, the civilian had no weapon or had a bladed instrument that, that he was displaying or had blood objects. Now, the problem with that in saying split-second decisions is that none of those attacks represent any substantial danger to the police life. 97.5% of all the fatal attacks were with guns. So what that means is that you can have categorical don't shoot rules for in excess of 400 of these killing cases a year. That means that somewhere between half and 80% of the cases in which police now shoot and kill, they don't have to do that to save lives. And don't shoot rules are only one class of those simple rules. There are also stop shooting rules because it turns out that the number of shots a police officer fires is a very important determinant of the likelihood of a death resulting. If police gunfire inflicts one wound, the civilian dies 20% of the time. This is based on Chicago's shots fired two years experience. If three wounds are inflicted, all of a sudden, it's a majority of deaths. So what are the stop shooting rules? Whenever whatever risk to life was involved in the initial 
justification for shooting if it has diminished radically because the attacker is substantially wounded. Those are very simple situations to stop shooting. But a lot of police weapon instructors say, look, don't take any chances. Empty your weapon. That only makes sense if the police department is valuing the chances of survival or the chances of death of the object of a police attack as being of zero value. These thousand shooting killings a year, these three deaths a day from American policing are in a class by themselves. And what is your response to the calls to completely dismantle or abolish the police? In favor of what? Uh, I mean, what you find out is that those are all metaphors. They don't mean abolish the police. There are many people that legitimately legitimately mean abolish the police, uh, basically on the assumption that with an institution, with so much institutionalized racism, with so much internal policing, Uh, and internal protections from police unions and also relationships with prosecutors, that the necessary changes that must be made to ensure fair policing simply can't be done from the inside, and the whole thing must be torn down and rebuilt. In favor of what? No, 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 that, it it strikes me, is, uh, uh, is thoughtless. The question, again, with, uh, with urban policing is compared to what? The difference between improving it and abolishing it is you've got to figure out what to abolish it in favor of. And in a country with 60 million private handguns, there are an awful lot of folks in the National Rifle Association that would think fewer police would be terrific. They'll do the job. And boy, I'll tell you, after about 15 minutes of living in that world, uh, I'm going to make a call to the Minneapolis police and won them back. Use of force as a mechanism of law enforcement should be abolished. I can think of no urban setting in the world of 2020 where that has been attempted. Definitely something that I'd like to research. I I do know that there are many non-urban settings where such a thing has been possible. There are many communes, for instance, around Vietnam that don't require any police force, that don't have prisons at all, but they resort to alternatives to violence, things like big communal town halls, these things to address any crime that takes place. What you're talking about there is voluntary communities where everybody subject to those rules has agreed to be bound by them. There are lots of households without armed police to enforce the law too. But those are voluntary associations. Those aren't cities. And the whole notion of city life is the mixture of large communities that are not clearly bound by the kinds of tight rules and preferences of ordering that you just described. Wherever you have that, you have a voluntary association and no need to treat it as if it is governing strangers. But as soon as we have to govern strangers to keep ourselves safe, that's when what you need is a much broader sense of the capacity to control that goes beyond the boundaries of consensual agreements with people who have made their own rules and are willing to be bound by them. And I don't think that it is even a legitimate part of a political program which will survive this. And is the reason why uh, police officers have not been held accountable, um, that there are many complex reasons why police officers haven't been accountable for their actions. Uh, Police unions, again, the relationship with prosecutors, I think public opinion, general trust for police officers. There are also accusations that the police force is an inherently racist institution. Do you believe that this plays part at all in 
um, the lack of prosecution for police officers who've committed murder or who have shot at unarmed black men in America? I, I think it would be a very minor influence. And one of the reasons is the statistics on all those there. We have too many problematic killings. And most of the victims of those problematic killings are white males. 95% of the people who are shot and killed in this country are males. 53% of them are white non-Hispanic males. Do police get away with those killings? Yes. If you don't have rules, you're going to kill African Americans. You're also going to kill whites. You're going to kill people who are in conflict with the police under circumstances where the police are both angry and uh, believe that the law has been violated. But those are unnecessary killings because they're not necessary to protect life. But those killings are so much more broadly spread across the population so that there is vastly more and vastly different than just racially problematic attitudes. Does racism play a role? You bet. Is it the dominant force in explaining American lethal violence by police? No. I think another accusation that's made, uh, or another cause perhaps, of the number of um, victims of police shootings in America um, is the idea that there are many people also note that when the police force becomes um, weaponized, then there's going to be a retaliation from uh, criminals to then become weaponized as well. Um, as the police have more guns, more weapons, then criminals will need more guns and more weapons. So do you believe that one factor here is also that guns are so readily available in America? Are civilian weapons and the ways in which they influence the cost of violent interactions in the United States important? Oh, yes. Do they also make police more trigger happy? You bet they do. But the reason there, it isn't that police armament produced civilian armament. It is the other way around. We kill an average of 50 police officers a year in the United States. 97.5% of those killings are with guns. In Germany and in England, the average number of police officers killed each year is either zero or in a bad year, one. In the United States, it's 50. Does that influence the amount of gunfire that police make? You bet it does. But there is absolutely no way. So what's very important is that you restrict shootings by police to situations where gunfire is threatened against them and where that's a realistic threat. That's going to save hundreds of lives. But it's also going to produce a situation where we're going to kill many hundreds more people every year in the United States than in any other major developed country on earth. And the reason is because of those, the ownership and use and proliferation of weapons and the ways in which those weapons can be used against police. There are many justifications for police mistakes, looking and making comparisons to medical doctors and the number of people that die at the hands of medical doctors from their mistakes. And um, Pew Research Center says that 75% uh, of police believe that they don't uh, believe that the public doesn't recognize how life-threatening their position is, and they don't recognize the complexity of their role. Should we offer a bit of forgiveness or a bit of understanding when police officers make mistakes? And the way that this would actually come out practically is, should there be less criminalization uh, or less punishment for police officers who make mistakes? Uh, and then on the other side, should there be more punishment for police officers who make mistakes that result in the death or harm of a civilian? Well, look, you can 
always make sort of defense lawyer arguments about the hypothetical nature of the complexity of policing. But on gunfire situations, if you solve all the simple problems, you're saving so many more lives. I really appreciate you spending some time here with me. Thank you very much. Okay. Good night. All right. Good night, Frank.